Okay, here is our government screencast on foreign policy and the presidency. Things you should understand at the end of this, uh, if you go down the bullet point list here, is what, what should be America's foreign policy? We'll look at different options. Uh, what tools do we use to accomplish that policy once we decide it? Who helps us accomplish this? And then uh, the last thing we'll touch on is what's the history of our foreign policy in our country? Uh, FYI, you do not need to know this history stuff on the test. It's simply to help with context, to help you understand where we're at today, which you should understand for the test. So first we'll start by looking at uh, what should America's foreign policy be? Right, the, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, as a country, should we be isolationist or internationalist? And we talked in class about uh, this example, the fact that uh, the International Labor Organization has estimated that there are at least 12 million working children in Africa alone. And instead of going to school or getting an education, they're working in order to sustain their families uh, and their lives. And the question becomes, is should we care as a country? Um, should we care about uh, you know, citizens in Africa and some country that may not necessarily benefit us, or should we just keep to ourselves? Isolationist would be the idea that we keep to ourselves, that we only deal with countries or issues that directly affect us. Uh, and internationalism would be that we engage with the rest of the world using diplomacy, maybe military, uh, and economically. So once we've decided this, then we can move forward. And at this point in history, our country, although some people uh, feel we should be more isolationists, is very much internationalist. We're very much involved with the rest of the world. So looking at that lens, um, then we have to decide what kind of an internationalist country do we want to be. Should American policy be based on our own national interests? Right? Should we worry about protecting our independence, protect our borders? Uh, make alliances with countries that can benefit us and help countries that benefit us. This would be a more of a realism approach, right, which is typically patterned after guys like Thomas Hobbes we talked about that believe that people and countries do things in their own selfish interests and therefore we should do that as well. Or do you think that we should take the high road, right, and base our policies on moral principles like human rights, democracy, freedom, helping others around the world? This is called idealism. Okay, so this debate between idealism and realism helps us decide what kind of policies we're going to use. And in class, we looked at this foreign policy continuum, right, where on the far left, you have isolationism, keeping to ourselves. Neutrality is slightly different than isolationism, the idea that we'll recognize that there are events going on, but we're not going to take sides. In fact, we might help both sides. Um, and then all the way up through <coughs> different economic tools that we can use uh, to military interventions and declared war. So whatever we believe, if we're realist or idealist, we can use any of these policies, but th those philosophies would help us decide which one we want to use and when we want to use them. Okay, so what tools do we use once we've decided if we want to be a more realist or idealist country? Uh, and here are the three that typically get talked about. Diplomatic tools, economic tools, and military tools. We'll focus on economic tools first, which involves uh, money, and economic sanctions like tr uh, trade embargoes or restrictions on foreign aid. So first off, the United States uses sanctions a lot around the world in order to try and punish countries who aren't uh, working with us or doing what we want them to do. For instance, if you look here, Cuba has, uh, we've had an embargo with Cuba for a long, long time. Now that's been lifted and is much, much lighter than it used to be. Uh, but also on countries like North Korea, which has made the news uh, in the last couple days, we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, here's Iran which we have heavily sanctioned because of their nuclear programs. Right, so we use economic policies to try and influence the decisions that other countries are making. Uh, we also have trade agreements with other countries. So here's an example of an important one called NAFTA, which stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. It's between us, Mexico, and Canada to try and establish more open trade so that uh, all of our countries can grow their economy. Right? One of the things we've agreed to do is to lower tariffs, which are taxes on imports. If Mexico makes a good, we have promised not to tax that good when it comes into the United States so that U.S. citizens are more likely to buy it. And the same thing goes when United States goods go to Mexico. And this has opened up free trade, but it's also made the United States lose some jobs to Mexico where the labor is cheaper. Right? One thing that the United States does to try and help with that is they use things called subsidies. Right? We talked about in class the idea of subsidizing sugar beet farmers in the Red River Valley up in Minnesota. Um, and giving them government money to help make their production cheaper. That way, sugar from this area of the, of the United States is cheaper than sugar, let's say, from the Caribbean. So people are more likely to buy American sugar and therefore help the American economy. So subsidies are a barrier to free trade, but they're also something that helps 
our economy. This is typically known if countries are going to use a lot of tariffs and subsidies as a protectionist foreign policy when it comes to the economy. Um, but we have become much, much more uh, of a free trade economy due to things like NAFTA. Uh, other tools, military tools can be used, right? Uh, as in force can sometimes be used, but also the threat of force. And at the end of the day, one thing we'll look at here is that the president is always the top of this chain of command, right? Um, and that, that title is commander in chief. Right here on the left, you see a picture of Lyndon Johnson during the Vietnam War, uh, Reagan um, with troops in South Korea, and then Bush during the war in Iraq. All, um, all presidents have a spike in their, in their power and their approval ratings at the beginning of conflicts like this because there's a rallying effect that takes place. But then oftentimes as the war continues on, you see a general dip in president's approval ratings. So uh, at the top, we talked about the military. You have the president who's in charge, right? And then you have this, which is called the EOP, as we talked about earlier. And if we zoom in there on the EOP, there's one particular department that helps a lot with military decisions. Okay? And that is the National Security Council, right, which was created by Congress and includes the president, the vice president, a secretary of defense, which would advise on military operations. There's a chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which we'll talk about just in, in a moment. A secretary of state, which would help with diplomatic decisions the director of national intelligence, and then a national security advisor who's appointed by the president. And this group is very important. They advise the president on decisions with foreign policy and specifically military matters. Once a decision is made, though, is passed on to the Defense Department. Right? And their job is to make decisions and carry out that. The Defense Department involves the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, and the Marines, all the military branches. Right? And they are controlled by the Secretary of Defense, who is appointed by the president. Also, though, serving in an advisory role is this Joint Chiefs of Staff, which involves the top leaders from the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and then a chair that is appointed by the President. So they serve as advisors to the President and also to the military, but they are, at the end of the day, accountable to the Secretary of Defense, who is accountable to the President. So there's a chain of command in our military that, at the end of the day, stops with the President, the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, we also have military alliances. The most famous of these is NATO, which stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And what, what the idea behind that is it's, North, it's uh, Canada and the United States, as well as a bunch of European countries that have created a military alliance and agreed to use their militaries to support one another. Right? This was uh, created shortly after the World, uh, World War II during the Cold War. At the same time that this was created, uh, the Soviet Union had the Warsaw Pact, where they allied with certain countries during the Cold War to try and show their strength. The Warsaw Pact no longer exists, but uh, NATO is something that is still alive and well today. Uh, besides economic and military tools, there are diplomatic tools, right, which we'll talk about. Um, and here we talk about how typically they use embassies, which we have 160 embassies in the world, and we'll talk about those in a second, but also alliances that provide collective security um, and all, uh, collective bargaining, you could say, with other countries around the world. So as chief diplomat, we have Nixon in China, who was the first president to visit China under the new regime that they had in the, 19, uh, in the 1900s. We have Carter in the Middle East, and then Clinton signing NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement that we just talked about. These are all examples of the president uh, going to other countries, greeting ambassadors from other countries, and uh, making agreements with other countries. All of these fall under the role of chief diplomat. Okay. So again, we have the National Security uh, Council that would help advise the president on issues when it comes to diplomacy. Okay. Uh, but once that decision is made, the president would then go to the State Department, who takes care of diplomatic efforts. Right? And there are ambassadors in, in all the countries around the world, we have 160 of them, um, embassies, one per country, right? and they are run by an ambassador who is appointed by the president. They deal with political issues. Right? They work with that country to help come up with ideas and compromises and treaties and any other agreements that we might need to make. If you were traveling around the, the world and you lost your passport, for instance, you would not want to go to an embassy. They wouldn't help you there. You would instead go to a consulate, which is also part of the uh, State Department. We have con many consulates in a country, especially a country like Mexico, where a lot of Americans do travel or do trade. Right? They typically are run by native uh, citizens of that country. And like I said, they deal with travel and trade issues. So here's one in Cancun. If you were traveling in Cancun and lost your passport, you would go to the US consulate there, and they would help you. Uh, aside from the State Department, we have alliances. right? And one of the most famous ones, or popular ones, is the United Nations, the UN, which involves um, 190, I believe, of the 194 countries around the world. 
right, which is uh, basically an international organization whose goal it is, is to keep peace around the world and solve international disputes. Uh, one example of that is just a couple days, actually yesterday, um, I'm making this lecture on, um, on Friday here. Uh, the North Korea has recently done some nuclear tests uh, in, their, in their country and they're trying to uh, develop more comprehensive and complicated nuclear weapons. And uh, they have been sanctioned by the United Nations, right, which means they're being punished economically. Uh, down here I highlighted a quote at the bottom. The sanctions were approved just hours after North Korea threatened the United States with a preemptive nuclear strike. Preemptive means that they would attack us with nuclear weapons before we can attack them. Now, the degree to which North Korea really means that is hazy at best. North Korea is famous for posturing and saying uh, crazy things. Most experts believe that they don't even have the technology to attack the United States. But it does make us question what we should do with North Korea. What policy should we take? Are economic sanctions enough? Or should we step up our efforts and take some military action? Right? And all of these fit within the debate of um, you know, idealism versus realism versus how aggressive do we want to be in our foreign policy. But again, this is an example of the United Nations, an international uh, body, uh, stepping in and trying to influence North Korea. It's just not the United States acting on its own. Okay, so uh, we've just looked at uh, the, the tools that we use to accomplish foreign policy and some of the people who help accomplish it. Now we're going to look at the history. And again, you don't need to know this on the test, but you should just understand the basics to help you know the concepts of where we're at today, our modern foreign policy. Obama has called himself a uh, real idealist when it comes to foreign policy. He's taken some very uh, aggressive actions like uh, using uh, airstrikes, uh, using drones, um, going after Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, but at the same time he's also very much interested in multilateral or bilateral action around the country, or excuse me, around the world. He's interested in, in uh, diplomacy and speaking with enemies and not just ignoring them. Right? So how did we get where we are today? Typically, we'd have to start way back uh, at the beginning of our country where isolationism was the main policy, to stay out, right? This idea of non-entanglement. The Monroe Doctrine, pictured down here, was this idea that we would stay to ourselves and we would keep other countries from influencing uh, the affairs in the United States. And gradually, as we move towards World War II, we're reluctant to get involved in World War I and II, but eventually we have to and we realize that we as a, as a country need to be more involved in what's going on in the world. After World War II into the 1990s, this leads to this idea of imperialism or hyper-internationalism, where we get really involved with the rest of the world, expand our power, our values, uh, our land, to all for kind of the gain of the United States. Imperialism is when we try and grow our power, sometimes at the expense of other countries. Here you see a cartoon illustrating Uncle Sam sitting at a restaurant and picking off a menu of what he wants, whether it be Cuba or Puerto Rico or different islands or countries around the world, this imperialist idea that we can take whatever we want. One of the things that led us to this is containment. This is when the Soviet Union is growing and communism is spreading around the world. And one of our goals is to try and stop that from happening, to contain communism. So we get very involved, right? Um, after that, though, we lead into this period of internationalism and wh where we are actively engaged in the rest of the world, uh, but also willing to work with the world and not so much be always the, the police or the leader. One example of why that happened is uh, during our imperialism time, Saddam Hussein was a leader of Iraq that we helped. Uh, but at the same time, in the 1990s, we switched alliances because of some of the human rights violations that he had. And we were then his enemy and went after him, this person that we had made a leader not many years before. Right? Um, the attacks on 9-11 are an example of the rest of the world reacting to the United States being involved in their, in their business. And um, that's why today you see Obama and, and his internationalist approach where he's more willing to work with the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, and there's a, a map of the United Nations just illustrating that, an international body to help make decisions. Okay. So I'm going to stop right here with this portion of the, uh, of the screencast. And we have just a couple segments left, but I'm going to make a second screencast to go to that. So uh, review these materials and let me know if you have any questions. Hopefully by now you should understand what our foreign policy could be, the different options, what tools we use to accomplish that, and then who helps to accomplish it, and lastly, um, the history behind it and kind of how we got where we are today. All right, let me know if you have any questions.